I want to s start off by thanking uh, Justin and Ali for inviting me to organize this panel. Um, and, and for all the work that they've done and everybody else who's you know, been making the conference run so well the last couple of days. Um, I'm going to actually, I think we decided I wouldn't do uh, introductions, take the time to do introductions, just have it, each panelist introduce um, themselves. And uh, you'll, I think, from their remarks, learn something about the nature of their relationship to, to Jose. <laughs> Um, but for all of the participants on this panel, Jose was both an intellectual guide and a close friend. And for all of us, I'm certain the shock of his death in December 2013 at the ludicrously young age of 46 has not fully relented. <laughs> Indeed, to treat his work with a distance of retrospect seems like some morbid and clumsy piece of performance art that he might have written about. Um, one thing that's been particularly meaningful to me about this opportunity to do this panel is the fact that music isn't etched into his bio in the same way as his achievements in queer studies and performance studies are. It's part of what's in some ways a richer and more sensuous quality of his presence in everyday life. To listen to and with Jose is to occupy a sort of netherworld at the conjuncture of critique, fandom, pedagogy, friendship, and love. It's an important version of queer utopia. So although he never identified as a music scholar, um, musicians and musical genres, bands, and songs surged through Jose's writing like a vital circulatory system. Indeed, his work as a whole would be unthinkable without the breakthrough acts of listening of his teenage years, instigated when he hap in the early 80s when he happened upon an independent record store in Miami and encountered the alluring covers of records by bands like X, The Gun Club, and The Germs, all bands that he would eventually write about. Jose and I were of a generation who were pubescent when first exposed to punk uh, in the form of sardonic segments on TV news about safety pins and gobbing and the infamous punk episode of the TV show Quincy. <laughs> but non lo not long afterward came a different moment, uh, triggered no doubt by some adolescent insight into whatever form of illogic or hypocrisy or fucked upness in the so-called normal that turned punk suddenly from a joke into potential a magnificent promise of an elsewhere, the exhilarating medium of, as Jose recently put it, a salient desire for an encounter. That phrase might seem vague at first, but it so aptly describes the deep bodily queer excitement that something that sounds so new, so alien, so prone to ridicule can generate. It's not even clear what the object to be encountered will be. That's the point. It's going to be something that rearranges your senses, your body, your sense of what's erotic. That's what I hear in the phrase from the germ song Lexicon, De Lexicon Devil that lends this panel its name, that sense of appetite, a radical promiscuity of consumption that's only as object specific as you make it in retrospect. Even though there was plenty of ugly reactionary bullshit and just plain stupidity in some precincts of punk culture, it nevertheless made kids like us feel a sense of dynamism and most of all it made you feel smart. And I mean that phrase exactly, feel, sm feel smart. It pushed smartness from a kind of stigma in the realm of homework and nerdy hobbies into a mode of being, dare I say, a structure of feeling. The best parts of punk as we second generationers consumed it valued wit, irony, and sharpness. Or with Warholian artistry, it showed how smart certain kinds of apparent stupidity could be. The best parts of it spoke from the position of the critic. But these parts were things you felt, and I believe that had enormous impact on Jose and the type of thinker and writer he became, Jose the Lexicon Devil. <coughs> Indeed, uh, one can make a plausible argument that all his work extends directly from the messy business of being a brown queer kid on the threshold of a subculture so often oblivious to its racism and hom homophobia. That position undergirds the rich and complicated notion of disidentification that he describes in his first book. And speaking of that position, and, uh, and speaking to this occasion, I'd also like to note, I'm certain that Jose would agree with me about this, um, that, Ho that Stuart Hall was actually a far greater presence in his work than is generally perceived and, and is maybe perceivable on the surface. Um, even, although Hall obviously didn't write about sexual politics, an essay like Encoding and Decoding provided an indispensable buttress for describing a process like disidentification. There is in Hall a deep commitment to tracking the ways the intentions of power leave themselves inevitably open to breakage, failure, miscommunications. 
For Jose, a certain poetics of such qualities, such miscues, their tragic humor and self-ridiculing grandiosity made up the contours of queerness, whether he found it in punk rock or queer performance or both. In some way, I think Jose's relationship to pop music scholarship was its own act of disidentification. For Jose to write about music wasn't to write about music so much because for him, as with so many things in his queer worldview, the boundaries of where music ended and began were tantalizingly blurry. For Jose, music facilitated private scenes of self-care, the classic queer teen alone in their bedroom, listening for another world through headphones, but it also meant nightlife and sociality and a reason to go from one place to another with no particular plan except the allure of something else. In other words, it wasn't an isolable object of study that could be extracted from its context and social, social relations surrounding it. He rendered its presence the way it actually exists in the world, in the background, in interstices, and then at a particular moment of vulnerability or necessity, stunningly forward and available. So I think we're just gonna go down the table here, and everybody's gonna. <laughs> sorry, Jean. Uh, everybody's gonna talk about uh, talk for about five, five, seven minutes, um, and then we'll have conversation a little bit between us, and then open it up. So, hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. I'm Jean Vaccaro. Um, I want to thank Gus for giving me a chance to think about um, music, which is something I don't do enough, and to meditate a little bit on Jose's work and the idea of queer noise. So I'll just tell you when. Not yet. Oh, go back. Sorry. Back <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this might be its own embarrassing thing. Um, in his essay, Teaching Minoritarian Knowledge and Love, published in 20, uh, 2005 in Women in Performance, a journal of feminist theory, Jose writes about love and commitment, his love of teaching and his commitment to teaching theory. A meditation on queer pedagogy and the performative utterance, I love my students. He describes teaching a seminar on Derrida and deconstruction, which was also the first class I took in graduate school. He recounts the transference, counter-transference, abandonment, failure, and eros of the classroom, and how, quote, the production of the desire for knowledge is a two-way street. He calls us, quote, young theory heads, which is to say, those who desire theory. As a way of reflecting on Jose's mentorship and the love we, his students, and in that, um, um, invoking several people um, felt for our teacher. I want to talk about the Brown Commons and the wildness of the commons, work that he wrote for his manuscript, The Sense of Brown, and about the queer noise of the 1970s in New York City. In 1970, uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. for Pay It No Mind Johnson, veterans of the 1969 Stonewall, Stonewall Rebellion, organized STAR, the street transvestite action revolutionaries. A caucus of the Gay Liberation Front, Starr fought for the protection of drag queens, runaways, and sex workers, thinking about the interconnectedness of gender self-determination, homelessness, racial equality, and the gentrification of public space, and the redistribution of wealth. In 1970, Starr protested at New York City in support of the Gay Activist Alliance and student sit-ins against the university's refusal of queer dance parties at Weinstein Hall. So oh, the first one was Marsha P. Johnson. This is Sylvia Rivera and Arthur Bell behind her. <clears throat> In a statement, gay power, gay power, when do we want it or do we? Starr declares, this is the question that is running through our minds. Do you really want gay power or are you looking for a few laughs or maybe a little excitement? We are not quite sure what you people really want. If you want gay liberation, then you're going to have to fight for it. We don't mean tomorrow or the next day, we are talking about today. We can never possibly win by saying, wait for a better day, or we're not yet ready. If you're ready to tell people that you want to be free, then you're ready to fight. And if you're not ready, then shut up and crawl back into your closets. But let us ask you this, can you really live in a closet? We can't. In 1973, Sylvia Rivera was slated to speak at the gay, ri gay pride rally at Washington Square Park. Yeah, this is another really awesome one. Um, so the sign reads, come out of your ivory towers into the street, and that's Bob's library, kind of in the front of Marsha. So in 1973, Sylvia Rivera was slated to speak at the Gay Pride Rally at Washington Square Park. Jean O'Leary of the Lesbian Feminist Liberation, who actually went on to become the first executive director of the of NGLTF, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, spoke out against Sylvia. 
stating one of the things lesbian feminist liberation objected to during this time were the transvestites. The way we saw it, here is a man dressing up as a woman and wearing all the things that we are trying to break free of. We found out there were plans to have a transvestite as part of the entertainment of the 1973 Gay Pride Rally in Washington Square following the march and we decided to make it a statement critical of transvestites. We decided to attack men who did it for profit, professional female impersonators and prostitutes. We decided we were going to stand up on that stage and tell everybody what we thought. We stayed up the whole night before the rally and typed up this little statement. We thought it was very important. You see, we were creating theory at that time. For Jose and with Jose, I am thinking about we. We as an idea and a problem, a shape to ask after. We invokes the possibility of a we, of a commons, and of thinking differently. The brown commons for Jose refers to brown people, brown places, brown feelings, brown sounds, minerals, flora, and objects. Brown as a mark of being devalued, diminished, of being rendered brown by migration, brown in vulnerability, in feeling differently, in radiating and refusing, in sharing harm and in flourishing. Brown power in sisterhood with black power and gay power and woman power. Brown in the shapes, enclosures, insurrections, queer ecologies, and queer noises of resistance. So I wanted to show a video of, so Gina O'Leary does take the stage at the Pride Rally um, in these amazing high-waisted pants and a weird shaggy haircut and says what I read out for you. But then um, Sylvia takes the stage in a much better outfit, a romper. And I'm going to show you a video of her response to Gina O'Leary's transphobic um, violence. So next one, and then click on it. Oh, no, go oh, back. Sorry. So you have to, like, I don't know. You have to turn it into a pointing finger. Pointing finger? Uh, Wait, no, no, back. Okay, now hold the phone. Um, your mouse goes in a different direction than mine. Yeah. <laughs> Where is it? That mouse is still No, no, no. How do we scroll? <laughs> You just use the trackpad. No, we're trying. Oh, we're really doing it. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So now make it big. Sorry, we're totally out of sorts. And then skip ahead a little. Oh, like, shoot. yeah, cool. It's loading. Stop it for a sec. Yeah. Because it's really good. You want to like take it off the top of it. Yeah. Somebody fill up some time. Fill up the dead air. Does anyone want to hit the lights in front so you guys can yeah. see the video a little yeah. better? That was a good one. <laughs> it's a dead stage. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. All right. Let's try it. Okay. I have been beaten. 
I have had my nose broken. I have been thrown in jail. I have lost my job. I have lost my apartment for gay liberation. And you all treat me this way? What the fuck's wrong with you all? Think about that. I do not believe in a revolution, but you all do. I believe in the gay power. I believe in us getting our rights, or else I would not be out there fighting for our rights. That's all I wanted to say to your people. If you all want to know about the people that are in jail, and do not forget Bambi Lamore, and Dora Mark, Kenny Messner, and other gay people that are in jail, come and see the people at Star House on 12th Street, on 640 East 12th Street, between B and C, apartment 14. The people that are trying to do something for all of us and not men and women that belong to a white middle class, white club. And that's what you all belong to. Revolution now! Give me a kiss! We could talk about that for a long time, but I'll be done now. Mm -hmm. So long, thank you. Hi, my name is Pete. Um, I was gonna play some music, but I think actually not playing is probably the better idea. Um, this is about friendship. So, if you're a person of my disposition, a person I mean who suspects that our encounters with beautiful, useless things like songs and books mm -hmm. come most to life in the fights we have about them, who finds loving objects and loving people, loving objects and loving your friends, to be modes of ardor that are forever unfolding in these entangled and recursively amplifying ways. A person who thinks criticism is maybe at its best when drawing from the vehement counterfactual love-struck energies of things like pop song bar fights and the hyperbole of half-meant denunciation. If you're that person, if you're like me, you're bound to give at least two cheers for Facebook. Like songs on the radio, Facebook is an efficient little technology of remote intimacy to steal a great phrase from my friend Karen Tonkson. And it's also, as most of you know, a fine place for discovering and disseminating and disputing about songs. Jose embodied as perfectly as anyone I can think of one great Facebook role. He was paradigmatically a lurker. <laughs> he rarely commented and he posted more infrequently still, but he was always there taking in the doings as with a glorious singing sort of meanness he'd be likely to remind you the next time you spoke. But I'm thinking today, as I've been thinking pretty steadily for about 14 months now, of this moment when he was lured from reticence. It may have been soon after Gus and I had gone to see the Big Star Third Sister Lovers Review when it played in Central Park, or maybe it wasn't. The proximate cause is a little lost to me now. But for whatever reason, I'd been moved to post the second track from Sister Lovers, which is the Big Star song, Thank You Friends, which some of you know, and pretty quickly, in the happiest and kind of predictable ways that do, things sort of heated up. Someone, and it may have been Gus, uh, made the observation that this was about the bitterest song of thanks in the annals of rock and roll. You can hear it from the start when Alex Chilton curls his voice around that line to all the ladies and gentlemen who made this all so probable. <laughs> Irony isn't really a sufficient term for the venomousness here. And as one friend, and it was probably Gus, summed it up, it was like, hey friends, thanks so fucking much for this junk habit I can't really get rid of. I'm really grateful. Um, that's not wrong. That's not a bad reason. That's not a bad reading of the song. But I remember trying pretty fumblingly to say something about how the song actually kind of spirals away from that spitefulness. And there followed some back and forth in varying degrees of smirk, snark and comedy. And then there was Jose saying, no, this isn't ironic. He means it. Though I imagine, you know, because it was Jose, he said it in a sort of spikier way. It was Jose on Facebook. You know, it's like seeing a dolphin break water. Um, and then we had this lovely little off-thread talk about what it could mean, meaning it. What kind of thank you this song could be. And we thought about the ways that, you know, the habitual big star gorgeousness pulls the song sort of elsewhere and works as this kind of recalibrating counterpoint. 
You could hear it in the upswelling background harmonies and the church-like call and response and the fucking strings that come in. But it's also there in Alex Chilton's voice. There's a shift in the chorus when he says, without my friends, I got chaos. Without my friends, I'd be swept up high by the wind. And his voice comes up. And at this point in the song, the note he strikes is closer to pleading than plaint. I would come to think of it as prayerfulness. So the last verse, that last verse where he says, thank you, friends, the one after the bridge, it seems finally to gather the song up and to transport it to some altogether new climate. Or put it, diff put, put it this way, the last verse seems to have returned Chilton to the self that believes in friends with wholehearted and full-throated conviction, even in the absence of any good reason to do so in the present tense. I think of it still. I think of it a lot as an especially distilled bit of Jose reading, or you know, of one mode of Jose's multiplicitous readership. It's a reading that hears in countervailing strains, irresolutions, and fractures, and it makes this capacious frame for them. It's a reading that denies neither negation nor affirmation, but pushes you to listen harder, listen a little closer, listen to the ways each of those exerts a kind of orbital pull on the other. Listen to the way that this despair might also maybe be something else, a giving thanks maybe for possibilities not yet given flesh, for the call of a love not yet arrived, not yet. So try to listen to it and not hear Jose. I've been trying on and off for a year now and I, and I can't, um, and that's sad of course, but that he is there still even, a song, even in a song so rebuking is also something else a little bit of pop magic, a three minute brief against chaos, a jolt of welcome mercy. So as Gus gets us set up, I think I have a slideshow and then if you could, or it's just one image really, um, but not that one. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm going to bring uh, in a, um, the a format that uh, Josh Clover introduced to EMP over a decade ago, and that's sort of critical karaoke. I can't help but do karaoke in some form or manifestation wherever I am. So um, what you have will be an approximately three minute, 19 second meditation um, on uh, actually Jose's relationship to Britishness, kind of in honor of, um, in a very sort of loose and implicit way, in honor of Stuart Hall. And so, um, yeah, so if we could start the track, and then once um, I start talking, we could turn it down a little bit. Uh, Just click on the um, speaker. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Cursor disappeared. Uh, yeah. No. I can try oh, this. Oh, here, we have to go into this guy. Um, and, like, I don't know why. Box. Oh, then. Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Wait, well, we could just turn it again. Yeah, maybe I should. When it's like inside. Because actually, I don't start immediately, so maybe if I start. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hmm. It's a long intro. Jose gave a fuck about the Oxford comma and those English dramas. Or rather, he loved the idea of the Oxford comma and the PBS comportment, white lady elegance, and perhaps more to the point, the twee soft British boyness it punctuated. There's an aspirational beauty to the Oxford comma derided, and thus also tellingly adored by the boat shooed preppy guapitos of Vampire Weekend who recorded the song, and who, like Jose, understood what the Oxford comma represents a discarded vestige of imperial manners and education, a relic of grammatical precision lost to a broken world of serial lists in which the final item, the final term, is no longer afforded a polite pause, the privilege of breath, or a dignified inhalation before the end, the full stop. Long before he was breathless, or what I've imagined repeatedly with horror, as the final moments of panic in which his breath shortened and he didn't understand why, 
He luxuriated in the long-drawn laziness of the Oxford comma on a 40-second birthday trip to Palm Springs, listening repeatedly to Vampire Weekend's eponymous album, which includes this song, as well as other Graceland-esque experiments in preppy pop meets world beats. Studio sweetened steel drums and restrained, if still somewhat hammy, organs scored his aimless bopping around the swimming pool as he ostentatiously held his pinky up while sipping vodka cocktails with friends in a mid-century Alexander with a cabana. This was the tony, white, gay lifestyle he had once detested and secretly coveted in transient moments. The locus of his own disidentification, a term he sang into theoretical saliency, with the aspirational good life afforded generations of gay academics before him in their fitted Lacoste polos, collars popped, who knew how to use Oxford commas while writing about Jane Austen as they sipped on Earl Grey and perhaps snacked on crumpets slathered with fancy jam. And through this disidentification, he crafted a queer of color world in mind and spirit that dabbled in such finery, even as it struggled to find its precarious footing on, to paraphrase this song, a lie about how much coal you have. This is the toll, the debt, in coin, coal, psyche, and body, such belonging and credibility demands, and much of his own work is devoted to manifesting this struggle, even as it keeps its eye on the horizon. In Audre Lorde's words, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. During our lost vampire weekend, Jose characteristically took great care not only of himself, but of others, undertaking his own soft guerrilla, spell it both ways, approach to political warfare. The brown commons, the work he would never finish, the life work and life force that continues to forge itself without him coalesced those nights under the desert stars while pretty preppy white boys played, danced, and sang for us, not the other way around for a change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everyone, and thanks, Gus, for organizing us. One of the first times I bonded with Jose was at an American Studies Association conference. He was wearing some sp slip-on Sperry sneakers. These are the kind of sneakers that my grandfather, Tom Love, used to wear with his high-waisted coach shorts and plain white t-shirt in the afternoons by the lake at their place in Hawthorne, Florida. They also looked a lot like the vans that skaters used to wear around Louisville when I was in high school. In affinity with both of these styles, taciturn, strong-jawed, crew-cut, southern masculinity, and lanky, evasive boyishness, I had started wearing Sperry's myself a few years before. The fact that I can't really pull off either of these looks is less material than you might think. I still felt awesome whenever I put those shoes on. That day, Jose looked good. He was wearing plain white sneakers with dark jeans and a cute short sleeve plaid shirt. I told him I liked his shoes and that got us talking about music. I had known Jose for some years already at that point. I used to meet him in the New York queer academic and art circles where he reigned. I was a grad student at the time, usually tagging along with Jose's and other people here's friend, Jonathan Flatley, who was my teacher at the University of Virginia. I'm sure some of you will know what I mean when I say that Jose could be pretty fucking intimidating. He was a star and there was only one of him, but there were a lot of people like me, hanging around, visiting from wherever, and trying to say something funny or memorable. For years, that never happened to me. Instead, I, tried to sp I spent time trying to pass off shy as taciturn and evasive with minimal success. Talking about music was a kind of opening, though, because it was um, to the side of the professional frame that, despite being totally queerdo, still structures so many of the spaces that we occupy. Talking about music can be a way of expressing the interests and desires that got us into this business in the first place, but without the business always ripping out the seams. Jose and I shared musical taste, but even more than that, we shared a kind of spatial and social and geographic orientation to music scenes. Jose wrote at length about this orientation in Cruising Utopia. Um, in his chapter on queer and punk, he considers the space of the club 
and geography, um, thus making his interest in music's function as a social psychic landscape clear. Um, so describing his fandom for LA punk, Jose writes, I lived in the LA punk scene via my semi-subcultural existence in suburban Miami. This was possible through a grungy alternative record store located in a strip mall called Yesterday and Today Records, a few punk and new wave clubs such as Flynn's on the Beach and Club Fire and Ice, and Issues of Cream, a magazine that covered the edgier rock scene but could still be purchased in a Miami supermarket. Describing this quotidian, unglamorous world, only semi-subcultural, Jose credits his deep friendships with other disaffected queer Cuban teens and the, quote, critical utopian function of punk with allowing him to imagine a different kind of future for himself. Jose described living in the LA punk scene from the outer suburbs of Miami. I think you could say that I lived in the Louisville music scene from the outer suburbs of Louisville. In middle school, I started commuting to that scene, taking the 55 Hounds Lane bus for an hour to the Brown School. The ride home was especially exciting since the bus went down Broadway by Cave Hill, down Grinstead to Lexington, and past the, mo the Vogue movie theater and the old White Castle. The bus was, a was awash with seemingly every Catholic high school kid in the city, but also my friends from the Brown School, who the Catholic kids made fun of for their short or long hair, their nerdy glasses, and their earrings. The ride was tense and exciting, edgy and unpredictable. It was, that is, until the bus emptied out after St. Matthew's and I started the long ride home down Westport Road. I got off at literally the last stop. Now that's another story, but I'll just say that life in Whip's Millgate was not all that punk rock. In Jose's writing about punk, I identify with the downbeat tone. He really gets what it's like to be a disaffected, or should I just say unhappy, proto-queer kid living in the exurbs 10 or 3,000 miles from everything you want to do and be. But I also identify with the feeling of utopia, the fact that the music allowed him to imagine, quote, a time and a place that was not yet there, a place where I tried to live. I feel really lucky to have grown up in Louisville when I did, being around these incredible artists who helped me to see just how much art can matter, what it can make possible. It's hard for me now to keep faith with Jose's endlessly open sense of utopia, his sense that the future is still not here, not now. In part, this is because we kind of did get what we wanted. Jose, as an adult, spent his time hanging out with artists, musicians, downtown divas, cute punk boys, fucked up lesbians, and really whoever he wanted to. And I get to think and read and write about art and film and music as much as I want to. And I go to teach my classes looking as much as possible like a member of Languid and Flaccid circa 1982. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. So the future that Jose imagined did arrive, but it didn't make him satisfied or nostalgic. Instead, he kept pushing toward times and places that had not yet arrived. One of those times and places is where we now live without him. Thanks. This is called um, Notes on Ephemera. Can you hear me? Is that picking me up? Okay. Um, a day or two after Jose died, a graduate student in my department emailed to tell me that she had found something she thought I would want. It was the 1996 special issue of Women in Performance titled Queer Acts, which Jose had co-edited with Amanda Barrett. Dora had acquired it several years earlier when in the process of moving offices, I had filled a discarded bookshelf with volumes I no longer wanted and put a big for free sign on it. I had figured that it no longer made sense to hold on to hard copies of journal issues when everything was being digitized. Dora had met Jose in fall, uh, fall of 2009 when he came to George Washington University, where I teach, as a distinguished visiting professor of English. It was a lucrative and pretty easy gig, and Jose seemed quite happy that semester. He brought Carmelita down from New York for the grad seminar he was teaching, and when Cruising Utopia came out in November, we did a big event around it, probably the first event that happened around it. When Dora heard that Jose had died, she went looking for the copy of Women in Performance. When she hadn't, what she hadn't known before that and what I had clearly forgotten was that tucked among its pages was a handwritten letter from Jose to me. Dora kindly returned both the letter and the journal issue. Here's a quote from the beautiful essay, Ephemera as Evidence, Introductory Notes on, to Queer Acts, which Jose wrote for that issue. Ephemera is a modality of anti-rigor and anti-evidence that 
I'll go slow because you have to, a, mo a modality of anti-rigor and anti-evidence that far from filtering materiality out of cultural studies, reformulates and expands our understandings of materiality. Ephemera, as I am using it here, is linked to alternate modes of textuality and narrativity like memory and performance. It is all of those things that remain after a performance, a kind of evidence of what has transpired, but certainly not the thing itself. It does not rest on epistemological foundations, but is instead interested in following traces, glimmers, residues, and specks of things. It is important to note that ephemera is a mode of proofing and producing arguments often worked by minoritarian culture and criticism makers. Okay, and here is a quote from Jose's letter to me that I had put in there. Um, I'm loving the proposal. Twist Barbie, that was my title, in the day, in, uh, in, those, in these days of Barbie studies, this is 1996, in these days of Barbie studies is excellent. I'm dropping this journal in the mail to you, and I do so with an agenda. I'm doing a book version of Queer Acts, probably with Duke, and I'd like some more stuff, any stuff about musical culture. If there's a developed queer angle optic with the twist piece, you talk about girl relationships before heterosexual romance, that would be great or anything you might have or want to produce on outpunk and so forth. I like the twist idea because I'm interested in anything trans-esque. There are so many things to say about these brief citations from Jose's writing and about my re-encounter with them in late 2013. I could talk about the desire produced and mediated by the ephemeral materiality of Jose's handwriting in this dashed out letter, itself reminiscent of a structure of feeling that I associate with the time before um, email was ubiquitous. Or I could note the gentle encouragement of the letter itself, which reads as a request of me, but which is actually a very generous and generative gloss on potential directions of my own work, and thus an informal act of mentoring of the sort Jose performs so often and for so many of us. I could talk too about the uncanny way in which Jose's profound meditations on the ephemera of performance and the relation of ephemera to my minoritarian critical practices set the stage for so much of my own interest in the archives of what has been forgotten, unseen, ignored, discarded, and disappeared, sometimes by minoritarian actors for whom disappearance, the very precondition of which, um, uh, the very precondition of performance is also a strategy of survival. I know that it is tracers, traces, glimmers, residues, and specks of things, as Jose so beautifully put it, that drew and draws me to popular music studies, and I like to imagine that he couldn't have come up with this formulation outside of his own experiences of what Barry Shank calls musical beauty, as well as what Jaina reminded me yesterday, or is musical dissonance and ugliness and efforts to protect himself from their corrosive and abrasive effects. I also appreciate now more than ever Jose's thinking about the ephemeral because it helps me to make sense of the things that remain, that assert themselves as anti-evidence, the affect of immaterial trace, but not the thing itself. I would like to think of our engagements with Jose's magnificent body of work in terms of his own insistent reclamation of the ephemeral, rooted as it was and is in the materiality of the violence against queer and racialized bodies and in those bodies' resistance to erasure. I admit to a certain discomfort about being a part of this panel. In the initial draft of the conference proceedings, by mistake, my name was omitted from the list of panelists, and I wrote to Gus, offering to quietly withdraw, <laughs> withdraw as it were without a trace, since there would be no official evidence that, had, that I'd been scheduled to speak. This reticence has several sources, the most salient of which is that I wondered about my entitlement to speak about Jose. Although I knew him for 20 years, I didn't go to school with him. I don't remember ever having visited him at home in New York, although I did see a lot of cell phone photos of his dog. And I wasn't, I wasn't his colleague. The Queer Acts anthology that he foresaw for Duke never materialized, and so I never even officially collaborated with him. But I'm so grateful to Gus and to Jose for the opportunity to think out loud and in public about the distinct kinds of intimacies that our academic lives permit, for the simultaneously attenuated and concentrated intimacies of friendships sustained by annual or best semi-annual reunions and more recently by occasional Facebook postings, for the sense of community that these transitory intimacies produce and sustain over time and distance, for the energy that lingers long after the conference, that works on us in subterranean ways, and which shapes our work in ways we both can and cannot acknowledge. This conference has once again reminded me of these ephemeral collective intimacies and the traces they very insistently leave. Um, so, 
in a bit, I'm going to ask Gus to put two things on. Gus, when I ask you to do the first one, if you can do a fade right after, just play a little teeny tiny bit. Because so this is it, right? Uh, the yeah, first one. Oh, the first one. No, no, no. Uh, it's actually close everything. Uh, I can run tech now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So and. And Karen really gets the so aesthetic the, dimension so of the for the first one. You want the lexicon. Devil, devil. I'm just just. It's going to be brief, and if you could fade, but then we need to come back up pretty loud for Ethan. So okay, <laughs> is that okay? Thank yeah. you. So you just tell me when now. Tell you when? No, 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 not, not yet. Uh, so this actually, even though it's short, it has a title, and it's called "Listening to Jose Listening." I love to listen to people listening to music. We do this all the time on the street or in the subway. Someone's plugged into her iPhone or his iPod, humming, groaning, or rapping along to a soundtrack inaudible to us except through their ears and the unselfconscious voicing of the satisfaction they're taking from what they're hearing. In all likelihood, what they're hearing is either the work of somebody with some kind of musical chops or perhaps at least pr production skills. But what we hear in even the most anemic, off-pitch warble of an enthusiast is the trace of his or her own pleasure. About three years ago, I started making what I sometimes refer to as uncovers, covers of popular and unpopular songs, stripped as naked as I could make them, indicating barely the most compelling elements, those were that, that were compelling to me anyway, of the originals with my own anemic pipes and a uke. I never hoped to replicate any kind of technical virtuosity, but rather to unclothe what I had heard that delighted or intrigued me, either in the words, their delivery, or in the original arrangement. The uncover is not a genre to everybody's liking. I often irritate myself. <laughs> Nearly everything sounds melancholy and a little too intimate, like someone, somebody breathing into your ear. But if I've taken pleasure in somebody else's music, I'd love to somehow communicate what that felt like. Of course, a more obvious way to do this would be to say it in words or write it down. It's not easy to do that well. Jose did that very well. Listening to Jose listening taught me two things. How to hear the poetry in punk rock and how to hear the punk rock in poetry. Many of you probably know his beautiful essay, which Gus actually referenced, uh, Gimme Gimme This, Gimme Gimme That, The anni Annihilation and Innovation in the Punk Rock Commons. It's a close reading of Darby Crash's Lexicon Devil, but before he gets to the song, he opens with a reading of Jack Spicer's poem, Improvisations on a Sentence by Poe, in which the poet communes momentarily with a seagull, and I'm quoting from the poem, alone on the pier, cawing its head off over no fish, no other seagull, no ocean, the true music. Jose reads against the apparent antisociality of the text, finding in Spicer's queer identifications across time and generations a, I'm quoting, mode of being with that remains desirous for the world. He hears in Spicer a resonance with the punk aesthetics and politics of Darby Crash, and hearing the proto-punk in that poetry allows him to hear the poetry in the music of the germs, not just in the lyrics of Lexicon Devil, but in the performance, auditory, and spectatorial practices that Darby Crash taught him. Crash's song, he tells us, and I'm quoting from the essay, is a plea for a kind of come-presence for both a future and a world for touching the limits of one another's being, much like the punk who staggers forth in a mosh pit, hurling herself against another body, not to do harm, but instead to touch in a way not predicated on mastery and control. This is what Jose calls the punk rock commons, and he hears in it both the aloneness of that seagull clawing its head off and the communality of recognizing one's connections to those other cawing, thrashing queers who preceded and will follow us. This is me listening to Jose, listening to the poetry of Darby Crash. Searching for a future world 
can fade. <laughs> Thank you. It's, if you don't know the original, it's different. <laughs> um, you can cut that off, fix. I think we've had enough. <laughs> Turn it off? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing the karaoke thing, <laughs> although I enjoyed it. There's another gorgeous text by Jose in which popular music and poetry are conjoined in an unexpected but completely convincing way. It's the concluding chapter of Cruising Utopia in which he hears in Elizabeth Bishop's Invitation to Miss Marianne Moore something very akin to the magnetic fields take ecstasy with me. In both the, these are his words, quirky pop song and in the lesbian poet's call, he hears, I quote, an invitation to desire differently, to desire more. It's all so good. Every time I start reading his words, I go, <laughs> to desire differently, to desire more, to desire better. He goes on, taking ecstasy with one another in as many ways as possible can perhaps be our best way of enacting a queer time that is not yet here, but nonetheless always potentially dawning. Jose heard the punk rock lesbian voice, punk rock lesbian in the voice of Elizabeth Bishop, a poet known for her somewhat tamped down, tightly controlled formalism. I'll never hear her quite the same way. I want to end by playing for you another piece of music, which is once again the sound of someone listening to Jose listening. It's a song composed by Ethan Philbrick, an extraordinary person who studied with Jose. <clears throat> Last winter, when many of us were feeling extremely disoriented and sad, he began a project called Not Sure What to Do. Oh, here's something. One of the, there's a Kickstarter for that because he wants to hire some other musicians to help him, so I recommend you Google that. Um, one of the first pieces he made was the one I'm going to play for you, and it's titled Elizabeth Bishop. The poem is one many of you probably know, not the invitation to Miss Marianne Moore, but the stately villanelle, The Art of Losing. He didn't expressly state it because one of Ethan's many lovely qualities is not saying what doesn't need to be said, but I think it's quite clear that you will hear Jose listening to Bishop's queer musicality in Ethan's musicking of her poetry. This is Ethan listening to Jose, listening to Bishop. And I'll just make a brief comment about style. As I was preparing to present this piece, I thought, well, maybe I should note that Ethan's style is not exactly punk. And then I wondered how I'd describe it. I found myself thinking it was somewhere in the triangle demarcated by Jose's lesbian punk aesthetic, our dear friend and colleague Anne Pellegrini's gay male taste for show tunes, and my own polymorphously perverse melancholy chamber minimalism, which is certainly not to say that we formed his musical style. Ethan came to us fully formed, his angel wings, pipes, and chops exceeding anything we could have collectively imagined. But that's to say, he's singing to our ragtag queer commons. And now I invite you to take pleasure in his taking pleasure, in Jose's taking pleasure, or in other words, to take ecstasy with me. So if you could hit that. something every day but just losing farther faster
thank you guys so much for all of those um, beautiful presentations. Um, we didn't do a good job of introducing ourselves <laughs> <laughs> on the line and just introduce Jean Vaccaro, Peter Coviello, Karen Tonkson, Heather Love, Gail Wald, and Barbara Browning. Um, and I think we have something like 20 minutes or 15 minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just kind of open up any uh, discussion to any anybody who's moved to ask a question or make comments, but also you guys should <coughs> feel free to to uh, engage one another. Yeah. Um. Just for those of us who are totally outside of all of this and have no idea what you guys are talking about, <laughs> maybe a two-minute explanation of who he, who he was, because uh, for those of us who are outside of this, I have no idea who you're talking about. Um, Jose Munoz was a, um, a scholar of um, queer studies, performance theory, um, who taught at NYU in the Department of Performance Studies for about 20 years. 20 years, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and wrote two very influential books, um, one called Disidentifications, um, sort of critiquing the standard notion of how people identify with objects of culture and um, arguing that, that it's possible to sort of identify across predictable categories, you know, uh, you know of sort of like a, um, uh, you know, uh, well, he talks about his, his own identification with some uh, uh, aspects of LA punk culture that were mm -hmm. actually contained very racist and um, homophobic elements at times, um, but his own kind of transfixation by the, the, the music itself. Um, and then he wrote another book which was published in 2009 called Cruising Utopia, which was a sort of theory of queer utopia. Um, uh, sort of politics of utopia, arguing for this sort of optimistic, um, imaginative view of the world rather than one sort of fully grounded in critique and negation. That's something. Anybody else want to add something? That was great. <laughs> yeah, I think it, he would joke around and say, oh, I'm not a music scholar. So he would also sometimes, I read about dance, and he would, he would, jokingly say, oh yeah, I'm a dance scholar, but the truth is he had a lot to say to the, although his own work in some ways um, on performance, in, in performance studies, um, you know, we, we, we <laughs> uh, people often talk about the broad spectrum approach, meaning going from, you know, very traditionally construed genres of performance to the performance of everyday life. And um, so he would always sort of dismiss his own work in relation to those kind of more traditionally construed genres of performance, except perhaps performance art, <laughs> which, uh, which is its own sort of animal in relation to all of this. But the truth is um, his work has been really influential in dance studies, which, as I said, is sort of my area. And I think increasingly music scholars are starting to uh, attend to some of the things that he had to say, not just about the bigger picture, about some of the... Um, racial, gender, sexual politics of certain music scenes, but also he really was a good listener, like a really good listener and a good, a very attentive viewer. And um, so I, you know, what I indicated about sort of um, his ability to hear music and poetry and poetry and music, um, I, you know, I think that that is a kind of extraordinary thing that he has to teach people in, in music studies, um, personal opinion. Um, and the sort of different um, archives, sonic or otherwise, that were activated by reflecting on Jose, say something about his kind of voraciousness for, for a range of cultures, um, uh, media, music. Um, he had a kind of textual promiscuity that made his work very exciting yeah. um, and that made, you know, sort of thinking alongside him very exciting because, you know, it, it, writing about, for example, a song, a pop song like Oxford, comma, 
Um, but having that activate like a range of other archives and sort of streams of you know kind of intellectual configuration that's that's really sort of the work that he modeled for people and I think that that you know that I think many of us carry is uh, in our own work. I, I was thinking a lot in my comments about um, mentorship even though we were kind of contemporaries um, and I think the first MLA conference I ever presented at in my PhD is in English um, I talked about pop music and it was a it was a um, panel that Jose curated um, so that's I think how I met him in the early 90s but but the ways that he and I think for many people who didn't even know him personally um, a lot of people speak to the ways that he his kind of intellectual fierceness and generosity and the, and so for me even that little note about well you know, I'd like something from you, and he gave me all these paths to think about. Um, so that kind of generosity and generativeness. Okay. I didn't know Jose as well as I wanted to, uh, but I had a couple of of interactions with him that echoed everything that you all are saying. One of the things that I noticed about is something that I said, sort of, but I want to say it slightly differently, which was his ability to find places that touched each other in sensibilities that I didn't know touched each other, right? And he knew they were there. And I could listen to him and then find places in my own thought, in my own world, that touched each other that I didn't know touched each other. Just an example, um, when he started writing about the gun club, he started the center of the gun club, you know, I knew Jeffrey, you know, we were in LA at the same time, and I never thought any of that stuff about Jeffrey, right? You know, Jeffrey was just, Jeff, um, uh, and so he gave me, he, he gave me a new way to think about what my life was like in Los Angeles, just from the way he talked about Remember, you know, the way, the impact that the Miami album cover had on his life in Miami, right? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the gun club's work became about so much more than, um, like, their sort of slightly fiercer version of the cramps, which is the way I thought of it recently, <laughs> right? You know? And, and things touched each other that had never touched each other before because of well, maybe just, um, Gus, I really liked how you underlined the kind of like how unlikely an object um, punk music is to like help you be queer or whatever. <laughs> um, I mean, and there's a lot of obviously like concrete links there in terms of, and actually it came up on the Louisville panel in terms of like these 70s scenes where, you know, there's sort of gay clubs and that's punk clubs are kind of indistinguishable yeah. and that's, you know, that's in that chapter that I was talking about yeah. too, um, some of those spaces. So there's concrete links there, but there's also a lot that might not make sense in that. And um, so it's also about finding those connections, tracing out those connections, it's also about forcing those connections or feeling those connections just because you need to or you want to. Um, and so I think that um, kind of having the courage of your convictions around that um, and like um, cathecting unlikely objects um, and, uh, and objects that are even kind of like could be seen as violent or dangerous or um, hurtful or whatever and, and using them for very different aims. I mean, I think it's like uh, Jose had a real talent for that too and I think sort of m like made me realize like how much that had, um, I had been doing that myself too but had never like thought about it or, or was ashamed of it or couldn't put it together or whatever. Um, so. So yeah, that's why it was kind of deep for me to be like doing this panel in Louisville um, and kind of like thinking back on on all that time. So that was a special contribution of disidentification too. Just as a theoretical work, what we're describing, you know, as making things touch each other that don't want to touch each other, mm -hmm. or you know, um, things coming up against each other that are uh, uh, it, and, uh, for any of you who 
may have been introduced to Jose today and are interested in like, you know, seeing some of the pathways that he opened up. This identification, I think, is really the work that accomplishes some of these really kind of uncomfortable, um, sort of forges these uncomfortable connections and thinks about like the discomfort uh, and also the sort of possibility in those connections. I think this also gets back to, I'm thinking of the opening plenary um, Stuart Hall where it, it brought up, you know, how do we, how do we teach music that we hate mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also a very productive sort of tension. And I think some of the things that, that you, know, you know, the work that Jose did was very important to me because it helped me think about how do you sort of not, not work those tensions out, but intensify them in some yeah. ways as a sort of critical exercise. And as something in some ways to model for students in terms yeah. of how to hold a lot of things in tension in your own Yes. Yeah. Uh, someone said something to the fact that Stuart Hall was important for Jose's work, maybe in a way that hasn't been recognized or talked about as much. But could you say more about any of you about what informed Jose, not from pop culture, but from academic scholarship? Uh, maybe maybe the people that Jose talked about the way that we're talking about Jose now. Is there yeah. Anyone? I didn't probably. Eve Sedgwick. Well, uh, yeah, Eve Sedgwick was his his mentor, um, and I, I went to graduate school with Jose, um, and she. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about, it didn't all come, it didn't by any means all come from Eve, but th there are elements of Eve in all of it, um, f from the mode of reading against the grain. I mean, so Eve Sedgwick is sometimes you know known called the. Mother of queer theory. Is that a thing? I don't know. That you know, she's sort of the the um, main figure behind queer theory as it came on the scene in the early '90s. Um, and I mean, one of the things that it allowed people to do in the literary world is to sort of read against the like. You don't have to read a gay text to to put, to um, generate a queer reading. There's you know, you can do a queer reading of James Joyce. You can do a queer reading of whatever, anything potentially. So that, I mean, that gave a lot of shape um, and strength to what became the notion of disidentification, I think. But Eve was also a person who embodied some of this sort of um, the collaborative ethos, the kind of combination of um, uh, uh, like linking being intellectual to having a community, to making a safe and nurturing community for the people that you loved and loved to think with, and I mean, it was a it was an incredible time to be in graduate school at Duke in the '90s, um, actually. Um, so, I mean, I think he had he, he there were different aspects, both academic and non-academic, like um, informing these qualities that we're talking about. But but Eve is the uh, is definitely the first person in that. Eve Sedgwick is the first person, I think. Unambivalently, Eve, and but then in terms of um, further afield or further historically going back, for example, Ernest Bloch was really important for Cruising Utopia. And one of the things, I mean, it's another one of these things that is really interesting about his work. And I would say, like, Pellegrini has the same thing, like, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So Pellegrini, as a, you know, somebody really deeply invested in queer politics and feminism, is not going to, you know, like is deeply committed to deeply reading Freud. I mean, she would, whatever. I, I don't, I don't want to uh, rehearse what her argument would be, but not to, you know, not to um, say, oh, I'm going to only go to places where it's a psychoanalytic theory, maybe invested in that, but that's going to get it to a place where this sexual or gender politics is going to be something I'm completely comfortable with, you know, to find the places of, of friction even in, you know, it, so the theorists can can be productive even if there are places that 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 produce friction in our work. So, um, yeah, which I think is a really super valuable thing in 
his work? I think also in terms of like critical race theory or, or I mean, let's just put it sort of in, in a more fundamental terms, like thinking through doing the work of ethnic studies or uh, queer of color studies. Um, there, there sometimes, you know, there's the sense that um, certain theoretical, Euro theoretical languages or archives are sort of off limits or it's just like, that's white theory. Why would you want to work on that? And Jose was very adamant about doing a kind of queer of color work that had that disidentificatory tension with figures like Jean-Luc Nancy, with um, many sort of thinkers in psychoanalysis, with Bloch, with bad guys like Heidegger, with, you know, um, and, and, you know, finding, uh, you know, what is to be found in, in, in a range, like, again, uh, to kind of link it to a sort of textual promiscuity and the idea that there was, you know, that nothing was off limits because of one had to sort of represent in a particular way. I mean, this is just, I guess I've, another thing I've been thinking about just for the panel was sort of like, um, you know, how, like, okay, punk rock made me homosexual, but it also made me a professor, and um, <laughs> and a lot of people from the Louisville scene ended up in academia, actually, um, and so that's kind of a weird, interesting thing to me, and um, so I think that kind of like, how did you relate to this kind of taste culture um, and this kind of arcane world? Um, you know, again, sort of pre-internet, so the sort of accomplishment of finding out about stuff was so much part of the thrill and and so on, and, and that it really, um, it really mattered, like, what you liked and what you didn't like, like, that actually had a lot of stakes, um, and that, you know, that sense of, of culture mattering or rhetoric mattering or whatever, I think has been so influential and in, or just sort of laid down the pattern that, um, that made uh, you know, being an English professor really makes sense to me. And so I think, um, you know, Jose as a kind of theory fan or collector um, is, you know, with really um, just like knowing about everything is really important, um, but also really um, it's, not, it's not just, um, it's in the context where making distinctions is actually super important too, right? Like you find what's good, but you're also really, um, strong on like what the problems are or um, whatever. So that that kind of model, and I mean, and I was like a theory head, a theory lover, um, like as soon as I hit college, basically, I just tra I just transferred those skills over. So um, so that's also a little bit how I think about about that um, sort of being having Catholic taste, but also really picking and choosing right. too. So I think we're out of time. So let's just thank panelists again, and thank you for coming.